Thank you for having me here. I'm an electrical and computer engineer, also in computer science, and I started working on transportation-related topics about, uh, let's say, five, seven years ago. At that time, I got involved in a project to build a real-time traffic monitoring system based on cellular phone data, particularly GPS records collected from cellular phones. And I was happy to see that over the years, similar services have been commercialized. There are now a number of companies offering real-time traffic information. Companies like Google, ASH, Inwix might be familiar to you. So when I prepared for my trip up here, I was able to type into the Google Map, Map service the address of this location I want to go to, and I got back a suggested route, a time estimate for that route, and a time estimate with real-time traffic. Now you can see here that I clearly did not type in that query during rush hours, because there's essentially free flow traffic during that time. But that information is quite useful, except that when I relied on that once in the sort of, you know, past time, I drove to Manhattan, and then ended up being 20 minutes late, because I had completely forgotten to take into account the time it takes to find parking. <laughs> so I started wondering about that other part of the problem, it takes a certain amount of time of getting there, and then it takes that amount of time to find parking. Parking is obviously often an annoying experience, but it's more than that. It's actually a quite significant societal problem. There have been anecdotal evidence from Brooklyn and Soho neighborhoods where, where people have uh, sort of done some, some monitoring of looking at how often the same car comes by the same traffic light or, or followed cars and bicycles. And if, uh, during, at some times they found that up to 45% of the vehicles seem to be cruising around the block, apparently because there was no option for parking or no cheap option for parking. The 45% of vehicles during that time, that means half the traffic on that road, almost half the traffic, was just due because parking is difficult. And then there are a little bit more rigorous studies. Donald Shoup has also written, he's a UCLA professor, he has written extensively on the topic. And there's one more rigorous study in particular from the uh, downtown business district in Los Angeles. And it's really just one small business district in Los Angeles, not the city of Los Angeles. And over the course of one year in that one small district, there are an excess 950,000 vehicle miles traveled in search of parking. We can then estimate the CO2 emissions that are due to that waste, uh, uh, the waste of gasoline, uh, environmental impacts, time impacts on people. And if you extrapolate that to the entire country, you actually get quite significant numbers there. And this is a pure waste that many people would be happy to get rid of. It would save us time, it would save us money, and might be good for the environment. So compared to other restrictions there where we would have to limit our driving, this would be where something would be very happy to take care of. So I started wondering, what if that Google query wouldn't just tell me the amount of time it takes, but also tell me it takes an additional 30 minutes expected to find a parking spot. And you can think about variations of that, or $1.20 to go to a parking garage. Or what if we had iPhone apps, or smartphone apps in general, they could give us <coughs> indications of where I have a better chance to find parking, and where I have a lower chance to find parking. So you could, for example, color roads with red and green based on the chance of finding a spot there. What if there were, could feed into our navigation systems in our vehicles and tell us, turn left here and you have a much better chance of finding a spot. And, of course, if you can have such data available, you could also use that for better parking management. I believe there are many here in that room that probably have even better ideas of how to use that information, but
setting prices for parking, determining time limits and maximum stays, determining where to install meters and where to allow parking for free. All these are the parking infrastructure management decisions that could be based on, on much more rigorous and better data if we had ways of getting that data. And in extreme, you could think of navigation systems that tell you, drive over there and you'll find a spot. Now personally, I don't think that's a very realistic vision, because by the time you get to that spot, it's most likely taken by somebody else. So I, I believe that providing more statistical information, giving guidance on chances of finding parking, parking is much more realistic. So how do you get that data to support such systems? That's the primary technical challenge in that. And the idea that we came up with is to use sensors on vehicles that can scan curbside parking spots as they drive by and detect which spots are occupied and detect which spots are vacant. You can do that with a fairly straightforward ultrasonic rangefinder sensor. Uh, don't be scared by this prototype. It's not going to look that ugly if it ever happens to be on your car. Um, but that's what my students had to drive around with. And this is a sensor that basically measures distance to the next obstacle. So as you drive by, it continuously measures this distance here. And the simple heuristic is if that distance is short, there's something there, probably a car at the parking space. If the distance is long, then there doesn't seem to be anything there. So you can use that as a basic detector for, for parking occupancy. So you build a system out of that by combining this, the, these rangefinder sensor readings with GPS records so we actually know which spots are occupied and which spots are vacant. We fed in a map of where exactly those parking spots are, which spots are legal, which spots are illegal, so we can match the sensor data with these actual spots. And we outfitted multiple cars and then fed the data over a wireless network to some central processing server, which then aggregates the data from, from these cars and can then actually compute those maps of parking availability and probabilities of finding parking chances and then feed that into cell phones or perhaps navigation systems and so on. Just give you a little bit more detailed idea is what you get out of this rangefinder sensor is a curve like that. This is, this is the time axis. This is the distance measured. So if the dis when the distance becomes short, that's a car right here. We can spot another car, another car, we can spot. And occasionally you have a little bit of noise here. You raise measures. So you can use, we started actually with very simple algorithms with the threshold detection. If the distance is fairly long, then there must be a car. Of course, sometimes you don't drive quite drive in the middle of the lane, or sometimes there's a bicycle lane next to you, and all the distances to the parked cars become longer. So you need some little bit smarts to adjust that threshold. And you need to do a little bit of filtering, get rid of some of the noise. As occasionally, there are obstacles that are not cars, so there's a little bit intelligence in there to look at whether this obstacle that detected is that has, does it have the approximate length that a car should have. So all that feeds into that. And then we get out counts of detected cars. We can correlate that with the number of legal spots and then get an est estimate of the number of free spots. And we get out, uh, we can even to some extent do spot matching and tell you these spots are empty, these spots are free. So we mounted some of those sensors on cars from, from our students and first we, we drove around in the neighborhood at Rutgers on every morning the students would come to work, they would put the sensor on and collect data on a, in a town called Highland Park that has curbside parking. And again here you see that, that sensor measuring distances to potential parked cars and get an, an estimate of, of accuracy for this, this fairly simple detection algorithm that can still be improved. But here you see the, the number of actual parked cars 
versus the number of estimated parked cars. And each point reflects one trip along, a, along that road with, uh, with parking. If the system were perfectly accurate, you would see all these red points somewhere on this line, on this blue line, which means that the, number, the estimate is, is identical to the true number of parked cars on that road. It's not perfectly accurate, but you see that the system is reasonably accurate. They can give you a good estimate of the number of free spots along a certain road, along a certain block. Errors on the order of a few percent. And some of the reasons you might er have errors is because occasionally there are other things there. For example, this planter in our very initial version we detected as a parked car because there was an obstacle there. After we adjusted the algorithm a little bit, it can now correctly identify that as not being a parked car. But you have uh, occasionally some, some weird scenarios. We had a bicyclist riding next to our measurement car, and that signal turned up similar to what a parked car looks like, and so on. So if you want, actually wanted to deploy a system like that, you would have to have a number of cars equipped with that system collecting data and feeding it back in, into our system. So how do you get these cars? Well, and how many of them would you need? One idea we started with is that you already have fleets of vehicles that are continuously cruising the streets. Taxis are one example, city vehicles are one example, potentially emergency vehicles are another example. So we, we started with taxis because they already have some equipment where you could better hide these sensors in, and because there are taxi records available that give us an idea of their movement and let us estimate the coverage we would get if we were to equip taxi cabs. The data we took from San Francisco, because at that time the New York taxi cab records were not quite that openly available yet. In San Francisco, you have a somewhat similar data set that was freely published. You can get the, the movements of all these taxi vehicles. You see a plot of, of one taxi over 30 days. So we did basically a, a simulation of if we equip these taxis with our sensor, how often would they cover these streets in San Francisco, particularly in the core downtown area where you really care about parking, where it's difficult to find parking. And the result came out that if you, with 300 vehicles, you could cover each, every block, one, on median, every 10 minutes. That's not perfect real time, but for getting near real time statistics, that's pretty good. Okay. Collecting such a data set over months and years would then also allow you to do a certain amount of prediction and give you a good estimate of how difficult it is to park in these blocks at this particular time that I'm trying to find parking. There are now other parking systems that are being trialed. San Francisco has trialed one, and New York has started a trial on a, on a few spots, as far as I know with a fixed sensor system which gets installed either in the meters or a sensor that gets installed in the pavement on every spot. That sensor can then provide you real-time data, but you also need a, a wireless network, a wireless backhaul set up to cover this area well so you can read the data out. The idea I'm proposing here is a vehicle-mounted system where each sensor can cover many spots as you drive by. And by that, you get a more statistical sampling, but you also get potentially much lower cost. A factor of 10 less expensive, according to our estimates and some of the published numbers we've seen on the cost of embedded parking systems. That assumes that you would need to deploy such sensors, but there are also some sensors already in vehicles. The sensor that we're using is quite similar to the parking system that beeps at you when you sit in the car and backing up 
Some of you have, might have seen these cars or have these cars. So these are sensors embedded in a bumper, ultrasonic rangefinder sensors. They are facing not into the ideal direction right now for our particular system. But there are others, BMW cars, they might cut in front of you all the time, <laughs> but they could also help you if you, because many of them now have a side facing sensor <coughs> that tells you whether the spot you just drove by is big enough to fit in your car. That's exactly the right position that you would also need for this kind of system that I'm proposing here. So, what I'm saying is that as these sensors become more prevalent, we may not even have to add additional equipment to vehicles. We could just crowdsource, collect data from all these vehicles driving the street already, and build these, these maps of parking availability uh, from, from these existing sensors. Now that creates other questions, however. And with that, I want to sort of slightly switch gears to the question of privacy. Now if we're collecting the sensor information from all our vehicles and feeding it to some central entity, there's potentially somebody that can track our movements wherever we go. Since these records are linked to GPS, you can see where I go at night, where I spend the night, you can see when I get ready to work. All of these records, all of that information would be encoded in the GPS records. And that's also a topic I've looked at for the past decade or so. And initially, that topic was sometimes hard to motivate. But these days, things have gotten much easier because now we have Facebook. And you find Facebook in the news with some privacy issue every other month or so. I started noticing that trend first time around 2009, when suddenly on the front page editorial of the New York Times, there was an yeah, editorial about locational privacy, basically explaining how all you, as you go about your typical day in Manhattan, there's so many different systems that collecting records about yourself, from swiping subway cards to cell phones to entering gyms and so on, that all that information can be aggregated to basically reconstruct completely what you've been doing during that day. And collecting sort of precise GPS records would only amplify that trend. We've also noticed that in the research community, there was a, an article that came out in, in Nature in, in 2008 explaining how you can understand human mobility based on cell phone records. And these are records, doesn't require any app on your smartphone, just records that are collected by your cellular operator as you, during your regular usage, regular cell phone usage. So there was a research team that analyzed those records from a large operator and then created sort of maps of, of movements and statistics of movements of a large population. There were some interesting results from an academic perspective that came out of that. But that, what I also found interesting is that on the popular discussion board of the Nature magazine, there was then an online discussion going on about a completely different topic. Basically, people were shocked that researchers had access to the data and that privacy question was brought up again. So how do you address privacy in such systems when you crowdsource data, collect GPS records from all of our vehicles, for example? You can look to laws as a guidance, and you will not find much for this scenario. There, is, there are laws for other subject to topics um, where privacy is more heavily regulated. And they, all these laws, whether in Europe or in the United States, they usually come back to what's called these fair information principles. If you're collecting personally identifiable information, you should provide notice to create awareness that you're collecting that information. You should give people a choice which usually means you should give people the, an opt-out. Or if you want to be more aggressive in terms of privacy, let them opt-in if they're okay with being tracked. You should give people access 
to the data that's collected so that they can verify that no that the information that's collected is actually accurate. And you should ensure integrity and security of that information. And there should be some way of uh, redress if these principles are not followed. All that, however, only really applies if you're collecting personally identifiable information. Our system doesn't really require that. It just wants to see where sensitive information was collected. It doesn't need to know who collected that information. So we have another option of anonymizing data in which case all these principles don't really apply. These records that we are collecting, they typically have some identifier like a vehicle ID or a network identifier, and then time, latitude, longitude, speed, heading that comes from your GPS. We can simply drop out these identifiers, render these records anonymous, and then we're done with Not really. This anonymization is quite tricky because we can often reconstruct who that data belongs to, even if it's anonymous. There were some debacles from AOL and Netflix where, the, where they were demonstrated. But to give you the intuition for location, even if you just have a collection of points and don't know anything about whether this point is from the same subject as this point and who that was, you can look at these patterns, and just looking at those spatial temporal patterns, you would say this is probably one trip, and that's another trip. Now you link them back together into trips. Then you can look at these endpoints of those trips, and see where do they come from, where do they go. And GPS records are often precise enough to point to an exact driveway. So as people go home in the evening or start their day in the morning, you can see exactly where they live and then you just need to look up who lives there. You have re re identified people. That's just one example. So records that you think are anonymous are not necessarily really anonymous. They can often be re-identified by linking them with other information. Other communities have recognized that. There are standards in the medical community for how to better anonymize data. Drop anything related to location that's below the level of a state. That doesn't quite work for us. If we want to monitor parking on a street in a city, we do need that little bit more precise location information. So I've started wondering, how can you provide better anonymization while retaining some usefulness of these records? And one heuristic that we've applied is that as these location traces become longer and longer in time, it's more likely, or it's easier to identify you, it's more likely that there's some sensitive information that's contained in these traces. That there's some sensitive location that you're visited. It's more likely that your trip back home is in there, so it's easier to identify a longer trip. A longer trip. So if we can take this couple months data and chop it up into short segments of just a few minutes, two minutes, three minutes, then it's not very likely that within two minutes, three minutes, you actually visited to a sensitive place that you cared about. It's not very likely that you can be identified. But how do you guarantee that you really cannot take these all these little segments and put them back together into a long segment? There's some theory in the electrical engineering field based on tracking airplanes, radar tracking, and we have applied similar models. I'll just give you the, the high level heuristic. If you see these GPS points and you have one old point and you, you get in a, a set of new points at a later time and you're trying to figure out which of those, uh, which of those new points is on the same car as this old point. What do you look at? Typically you look at the direction and speed and heading information that you have, and then extrapolate where that car would be at this new point in time. And if this, in this case, this one seems closest to the estimated position, so you'd say it's likely that this point belongs to that one and not those. If, however, you have a different scenario where you estimate the new position to be here, and then you have three 
vehicles that are reporting a position about equally far from, from this estimated position, then you're confused and you're not really sure which of those three vehicles is the same one as the old vehicle. That confusion is good for privacy. And you can formalize that and can take different <coughs> metrics of distance based on road distance, for example, and compute something called uncertainty that's popular in the electrical engineering community as a measure of confusion. And then you can build algorithms that take these long, month-long records of data and chop them up into small segments and drop information as necessary to ensure that somebody looking at the data will be confused when trying to put it back together. So that's what we have done. And then you can, you can run this over a large data set and you'll see that most of the dropping of information occurs, these are the black dots being dropped here, around the out, outskirts of a city where the movements or the population density is more sparse. If it's sparser, it, it's easier to track the path of one person. If there are many people mingling around and walking chaotically, it's harder to follow the path of one particular person from these GPS records. We've then built systems. First, the traffic monitoring system that I mentioned, where we applied similar ideas but, but also introduced that concept of a, of a trip line that we want to collect location at a certain particular or at a particular location across the road. we we'll mark all these locations and by, get, by that we can first make sure that we're not collecting locations around, uh, data around particular sensitive locations, a hospital entrance for example. And we can also make sure that we're getting information from those locations that we care most about. Was a, the Berkeley Mobile Century experiment, the uh, hundred cars that uh, my student had helped put the, the system together and build in some privacy mechanisms there. And then more recently, we have designed these ideas into sort of an extended version that we call a, a VTL zone, virtual trip line zone, which allows us to collect records in a certain area that we really care about. For example, a particular intersection with a particular traffic light which uh, if we want to st study that traffic light performance. So we would collect data there, not around here, and then filter this data as necessary to ensure a similar degree of anonymity. That brings me to the end of my presentation. So I hope I convinced you that sort of GPS positioning and mobile sensing allows sort of a lower cost crowdsourcing of transportation information, for example, parking information. Uh, it does raise privacy concerns, but uh, these, they can be addressed through a more careful privacy by design approach by thinking about privacy applications as you're designing that system. And I want to emphasize that, like any privacy security mechanism, anonymity is tricky. Stripping out just the identifiers is not sufficient, but there are mechanisms to create not perfect, but stronger degrees of anonymity that one can use. Thank you for your time. Um, um, I would like to go back a little bit to the original problem that was uh, trying to guess more or less the high probability of parking in different areas. And of course, this um, when you have a model, a statistical model, Usually, um, you talk about a static model. So you can say that you know in this street, there's, you know, I don't know if you're tranching by hours or by minutes, but usually you would say something like on Mondays at 9 a.m., this street has this many, on average, has this many you know, free spots. Um, the problem with that is that as soon as you use this to feed back information, to the people that want to find parking, you're, you are changing the pattern, or the system is changing the pattern. So if there is a high probability of parking the street, and you feed that to 40 potential cars that are going to compete with the only 10 available spots, you might actually be creating some more of a problem, which goes a little back. Are you 
going to do this with a central controller that will suggest different patterns in order to avoid this kind of thing? Absolutely, that problem exists. We haven't carefully looked at yet. We know it exists from the real-time traffic monitoring work where the same problem is present there. But the, we are using a fairly central entity, so it would absolutely be possible to give different directions to different people and, and modify those directions based on the number of people that ask.